he descended into hell. Although it is clear from the works of the early fathers who explained the creed that this was not a clause universally agreed among the churches, it should not, in my view, be left out, for it contains a great and outstanding mystery. Certainly, there are some old writers who do not neglect it, which leads us to conjecture that it was added soon after the time of the apostles, but that it only gradually came into use. Be that as it may, there is no doubt that it derived from what all true believers should assert and hold. For none of the early fathers omits to record Christ's descent into hell, even though they interpret it in different ways. It is not therefore very important to know by whom and when the statement was inserted into the creed. Rather, we should be aware that here we have a full and complete summary of our faith, in which nothing is lacking and in which nothing is said which is not taken from God's word. So far as this clause is concerned, it will soon become apparent that it is so vital to the fulfilment of our salvation that it cannot by any means be omitted. Various explanations exist. Some consider that nothing new is being stated here, but that what was earlier said about the burial is being repeated in different words, because hell is often taken in the sense of grave. I concede that, in their interpretation of the word, hell is often used instead of grave. There are, however, two arguments which tell against this idea, and which I think are enough to refute it. It would be quite frivolous to explain clearly and straightforwardly a point which poses no problem in itself, and then to repeat it in a much less lucid way. For when two expressions are used together to signify the same thing, the second should rightly clarify the meaning of the first. Now what sort of clarification is it to explain the burial of Jesus Christ as a descent into hell? It is, besides, unlikely that in this summary which briefly and succinctly outlines the main articles of our faith, the Church of Old would have wished to insert so superfluous and needless a statement which would have had no place even in a much longer work. I do not doubt that those prepared to give more careful thought to the matter will agree with me. Others understand hell to mean some subterranean region which they label with some such name as limbo. There, they believe the fathers who lived under the Old Testament were shut up as in prison, until Christ went down to liberate them, even as he broke the gates of brass and the bolts of iron. This fiction, although supported by weighty authors and although still held to be true today, is nevertheless just that, a fiction. The appeal which they here make to Zechariah and to Peter is quite beside the point. When the prophet proclaims that the Lord, by the blood of his covenant made with Zion, rescued the captives from the waterless well, he is not referring to the dead, nor to limbo. By the waterless well, he means the pit or abyss of misery where all sinners are, and by captives, he means people in the grip of dire calamity and distress. And when Peter writes that Jesus Christ came in the Spirit and preached to the spirits in prison, all he means is that the power of Christ's redemption was made known to the spirits of those who were already dead. For it was then that believers, having always hoped in him for salvation, now fully and so to speak visibly acknowledged his visitation and presence. The reprobate, on the other hand, knowing that he was the universal saviour and that they were shut out, received clearer confirmation that there could be no further hope for them. The fact that, without distinguishing them, Peter puts the righteous and unbelievers together in prison, should not be taken to imply that the righteous were strictly confined as captives until the coming of Jesus Christ. But because they beheld their redemption from afar and in dark, shadowy form, their expectation could not but have been anxious, and is thus compared to a prison. <laughs>